Um, <laughs> so uh, welcome to this panel. One of our guests will be arriving uh, in the course. This is the first panel of the conference. We've had some introductory meetings and excellent lectures. But the uh, conference this year is entitled International Law and Practice. Uh, in fact, the Hudson Medal winner is a practitioner. We've heard lectures from people who are in practice. Um, the roles that international lawyers play, some of them are self-explanatory. Uh, the role of the publicist or academic is well known and many of you play it. Um, the role of the advocate, for example, arguing at the uh, International Court of Justice or other dispute resolution uh, mechanisms is also well known. But less well understood is the role of the counselor in international law, who often is uh, uh, navigating the role between domestic and international law from a wide range of perspectives. So simply put, this is a panel on best practices for counselors in international law. Um, in other words, we will be studying and discussing a number of issues through uh, a series of common questions. Uh, what is the scope of appropriate internal advice? Uh, what are some of the challenges that uh, counselors face? Uh, what uh, is the way that you have the best interaction with your decision-making client? How do you deal with ethical dilemmas? And do you have obligations to constituencies other than your own immediate client? Uh, to address these questions, we've assembled an uh, extraordinary cast of uh, individuals from a number of different countries and organizations. Um, who is not here yet but will join us shortly is Marcelo Vasquez Bermudez of the UN International Law Commission. To his left, uh, my dear friend Manush Ar Arsanjani, who is of the World Bank Administrative Tribunal, formerly the Director of Codification Division of the Office of Legal Affairs at the United Nations. To her left, Scott Little of the Trade Law Bureau of the Government of Canada. And to his left, uh, my old friend and colleague, Stephen Preston, uh, a partner at the firm of Wilmer Hale, uh, formerly general counsel of uh, the Central Intelligence Agency and the Department of Defense in the uh, Obama administration. Uh, my name is Harold Coe. I teach at Yale Law School. My relevant experience to this was to have served as a legal advisor to the State Department in the first half of the Obama administration. Uh, so we will have uh, five different sections of this panel, which will run for uh, 90 minutes. First on role, second on challenges, third on ethical obligations, uh, fourth uh, a lightning round, where I will ask uh, short questions and hopefully get short answers from the various uh, panelists about things like, uh, what, what would you do if your client uh, wanted to suddenly impose uh, stiff steel tariffs or send the National Guard to the border uh, and other such hypothetical questions. Uh, and then a question and answer in period from the government, bef uh, from, from the audience before we get con concluding thoughts from our clients. So uh, let me start with um, the question of role. Uh, each of you I'd ask you um, to explain what your role was as a counselor in international law. Uh, both before and now, uh, who is your client and what do you think their interests are? Or how did you define your counseling role vis-a-vis -vis, uh, your client? Uh, most of the people here had one client, an institutional client, uh, at a time, which is an unusual situation. So we'll start with Manush. Uh, thank, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. I apologize uh, for my voice. Uh, I'm just trying to battle uh, with a cold. I, uh, I speak on, from the perspective of a lawyer for the United Nations where I worked at the legal department on a variety of level for almost 32 years. And uh, I, to me, I'm talking about lawyers at all levels. In my view, they are involved in the same mission and they are subject to the same considerations. Clearly, the uh, head of the legal department and his or her uh, deputy are political appointees, and they play a key role in the interpretation of the charter and the mission of the organization. 
International organizations are obviously different from national governments. Um, so to understand the role of the legal advisor, one has to understand something about the organization, its construction under the charter, and the evolution that the organization has gone through. The Secretary General is the chief administrative officer and is the major client of his or her uh, legal advisors. But the situation is more uh, complicated. The UN and I believe um, uh, other international organizations are member driven. So in a complex way, the member states of the UN, in addition to the Secretary General, are also clients. Unlike legal advisors of a government, the uh, legal advisor of international organizations does not represent one subject of international law. The, the legal advisors of a government represent a single government with a clear, uh, hopefully a clear political, economic, and strategic objectives. But international organizations are a collectivity of subjects of international law. UN is a, a mixture of principal organs, subsidiary organs, funds, and programs, each of which have their own agenda and their own policy, and they uh, have uh, strategic ways of achieving those. So the UN legal advisors actually uh, represent a, a multiplicity of clients. Now, international law at international organizations is a, is a broad subject, is in addition to a uh, typical public international law that we understand, uh, it involves um, administrative law, uh, it, uh, it involves uh, uh, very specialized areas of law, um, such as the, um, the law of international institutions, it involves uh, um, regular, um, law of a contract or tort, and, uh, commercial law, trade particularly with respect to the uh, depositing of, of treaties. And the legal advisor operates in an evolving legal and political environment. International uh, organizations, uh, lawyers, are part of a general civil service and are subject to the same administrative <coughs> considerations of all the other civil servants. And under Article 100 of the Charter, uh, the parameters which defines the parameters of international civil servants, neither the Secretary General nor the staff are uh, supposed to take any instructions from the governments. So, um, Manish, if we could just take your most, one of your most famous assignments, there was uh, the drafting exercise for the Rome Statute for the International Criminal Court. Uh, this is in the function of codification. How did that assignment come to you and then how did you discharge it with staff and how did you get input from uh, the Secretary General or others in the course of doing that? The, um, the legal office, is the way that it is organized, is uh, there are various departments within it. I worked in the codification division, and it's the primary responsibility of it is, is to work with the legal committees uh, of the General Assembly and the International Law Commissions, which is the primary um, subsidiary organ uh, entrusted with drafting <coughs> multilateral treaties. So I followed the, the uh, Rome, well, eventually became the Rome Statute, but the International Criminal Law and Criminal Court from the time that it was in the, inter the, in the International Law Commission. Lawyers that they work in the codification division, in fact, they have a very interesting job in a way that they have to um, study various topics of subject international law as it becomes part of the agenda of the commission. So I primarily, myself, I didn't know anything about the criminal law. So it was a self-education. So you sort of delve into the subject. You try to understand, you understand the, try to study the international humanitarian law, international human rights law. And um, part of the function of a lawyer in that capacity is to be a support for the governments. And governments normally, and I have to say not 
all of them, but normally come with experts in the area. So it's not that um, the function of a lawyer is to educate, but the function of the lawyer is to be educated enough to be able to quickly follow the discussion, to be able to uh, deal and work with the bureau or the chair of the various committees that they deal with the uh, uh, variety of topics of the international uh, criminal law. And um, so it's, it, it is a support, but at the same time, you sort of show some of the pitfalls that they, the, the general de the discussions uh, might not have considered or the omissions. And at the end of it really is the, which happened in Rome, is to putting together the whole, because the Rome Statute is a very large uh, multilateral uh, document, putting the whole thing together. So if I and could then just the add consistency, the, the, uh, there has to be a congruence between the various provisions. And that pretty much falls on, on the responsibility of the Secretariat to constantly be on top of it, to make sure that one provision is not really denying the other one, it comes into conflict with the other one. So it, this is, but you have to understand that the lawyers uh, in the Secretariat, they always work in the background. So we're not really the forefronts of, uh, I had a former director who said that the best function, uh, the most qualified uh, secretary of a committee is to be seen but not to be heard. So that you always try to work quietly in the background rather than uh, having any position because after all, it, it, these are the governments who have to make a decision. So just to give uh, the audience a sense, you, you once told me that when you got on the plane to Rome in the summer of 1998 with the draft Rome uh, statute, there were a certain number of bracketed language and text. How many brackets do you remember? Oh, <laughs> um, the, when the, uh, uh, Rome, the, the original document of the uh, Rome Statute came out of various um, working groups, ad hoc committee in the General Assembly. It was, um, I think, about 400 something provisions with uh, square brackets and nota benes. And the, um, what happened after that, um, the chairman the, 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 of the ad hoc committee at the time, who was Adrian Boss, uh, um, a Dutch, legal advisor, invited a number of the committee members, and these are key um, individuals who were well-versed in the various topics that were discussed, and they were sort of coordinating work with the delegations and with the secretariat, which was myself and a colleague of mine in, the, uh, in Zutphen, in the Netherlands, and our function was to these were, uh, there, there was no coordination, there were no chapters. They, they were just articles completely out of order. So it was a completely, uh, very thick document if you look at it now. Um, it, we, within one week, we had to put together um, the whole um, Rome statute, so to speak, with the variation of chapters, bringing articles together getting rid of a lot of nota benos and a lot of the square brackets, and bring, making it something that it looked like, more like a, a treaty. It didn't look like in the past like a treaty. So what we presented it eventually, and that the Secretariat gets some, uh, should get some credit for it, but as I mentioned, we always work behind the scenes, so it's not, um, it, it's not something that we impose. But in a smaller group as such, the Secretariat has more uh, opportunity to express views to remind the um, the members of the bureau where the um, uh, where the where the problems were and, and as such. Great. So this is one role of the counselor is exposing both grand choices and uh, micro choices with regard to critical legal documents. Now we have uh, the the Rome Statute is now in its twentieth year. Uh, which is a great accomplishment on your part, among, among many others. So Scott Little, how about yourself? Role, clients, and interests. Uh, thanks, thanks for the introduction, Harold, and thank you for the uh, opportunity to speak 
at this session to the conference uh, organizers. So as uh, legal counsel with Canada's Trade Law Bureau, the client of our team is ultimately uh, always the Government of Canada. We're essentially the in-house law firm for the Government of Canada in uh, any and all matters relating to the international trade and investment obligations that Canada and its trading partners have assumed under various international treaties. So, so for example, renegotiation of NAFTA would so be for, in your... Uh, <laughs> it's, a, it's a small task that's taking up a, a minimal amount of our time right now. Yeah, um, so uh, as legal counsel, our role <coughs> includes, uh, as, as Harold's noted, the, providing legal support in the negotiation of free trade agreements or, or bilateral investment treaties. We also serve as counsel uh, in international trade or investment litigation by or against Canada under these treaties. So uh, investor state arbitrations um, or dispute settlement proceedings before the World Trade Organization. And then finally, we, we prepare legal opinions uh, government-wide uh, on whether, for example, domestic measures taken by Canada or even measures taken by its trading partners engage or risk uh, violation of uh, these trade obligations. So if there's a case brought against Canada uh, by a foreign government under a trade agreement, you, you are the person who represents as an advocate in the court? In the exactly. Canada has, has very much centralized uh, the, the role of counselor at international law, international trade law, in the trade law bureau. So whereas I know it's a little bit more decentralized in the United States, we provide support to the negotiators of, of treaties. We also act as advocates uh, in, in any litigation context, uh, with some exceptions where uh, the work is outsourced to, to private counsel. But for the most part, we've tried to uh, keep that um, work in-house because it, it helps to contribute to an institutional knowledge and expertise, which um, given our NAFTA, especially NAFTA Chapter 11 experience, um, has, has um, really grown over the last 20 years. Now, for the uninitiated, the, the NAFTA claims are claims brought by NAFTA investors, companies from a NAFTA country, uh, against the government alleging a breach of the NAFTA investment protection obligations contained in Chapter 11. And these are heard by a, typically by a three-member tribunal that can award uh, monetary damages against the state um, if it determines that the obligation has been breached. In terms of uh, the, the client's interest in these cases, well, as in, in any litigation context, the primary interest of the client is a successful defense um, of the international case being brought against it. But success has, has a number of yardsticks. Um, first and foremost, the client's always happy when you don't have to pay an award of monetary damages. But um, almost equally as importantly, as investor state arbitrations challenge a regulatory measure or the manner in which a regulatory regime has been implemented or carried out, and they uh, typically always raise some type of a matter of domestic public policy that there's a value in uh, having implemented or legislated. Uh, the client is very interested in a ruling that upholds or at the very least doesn't call into question the, the legitimacy of the policy objective underlying the measure being challenged. And then finally putting aside these these primary interests of prevailing in the arbitration, uh, a related interest is to obtain favorable rulings uh, with respect to the many interim decisions or determinations that have to be made in a litigation over the course of the litigation. And I'll, I'll try to touch on a couple of these. You know, you've been speaking discussed. in terms of defense, but what about when you initiate a claim? Is that the same role? Uh, well. It's kind of the same role, but a mirror image of it. You want, you want to actually, um, for example, in the WTO, uh, an offensive claim against uh, another state's measure, you want to have that measure uh, declared as being non-compliant with, uh, with a WTO obligation that's at issue in the case. Of course, in a, an investor state arbitration, and that's really my, my realm of expertise, you're always operating in a defensive, uh, in a de defensive context because it's really the investors that bring these claims against the government. And how do you advise your client about the chance of success, and what do you do when you lose? <laughs> you don't think about losing. Uh, at the beginning, obviously, um, well, these, these cases, you learn so much about them as they unfold, but at the, at the very beginning, uh, 
the objective is to come up with um, as comprehensive a preliminary legal assessment to pronounce on risk, uh, to pronounce on what's the likelihood of a successful or an unsuccessful defense. And from there, we govern ourselves accordingly. Um, at the end of the day, uh, yes, we have lost some cases, and um, that's <laughs> you, you obviously take with you perhaps what worked or what didn't work in the course of the the, uh, the arbitration from a legal strategy perspective. But really, at the end of the day, all that's left to do um, in in a NAFTA Chapter 11 context is to make sure that the payment of damages is made. Because unlike in the W2O realm, it's not a um, uh, NAFTA tribunals aren't empowered to say rescind the measure. Um, and how do you deal with the multiple audiences? You, you, for example, you might uh, be uh, urged to make a certain kind of statement to uh, address the domestic audience. On the other hand, it might be something that would annoy the tribunal. Uh, on the other hand, it might be something that might spur a response from the opposing party. But your client wants to do it because they want to do it. Um, well, obviously, you you provide recommendations to your client in terms of the best way to, um, to, to comport yourself or for the state to comport itself in the course of the, of the actual litigation. And we find that um, given that this is a pretty specialized area, it's a quite a niche area, that our recommendations are, are generally accepted and we're given quite, quite a fair bit of latitude to conduct the, the litigation. In terms of um, uh, governments a many-headed beast, there's, there's other ways that, um, uh, I guess, uh, messaging, for example, that could get out to the tribunal that has those implications. But uh, government's also quite good at um, navigating um, a legal defense and also communications with respect to that legal defense. We have communications departments that, that would take care of that. Do, do you say to your client, don't tweet uh, about the case while we're... <laughs> we don't have the tweeting affliction that uh, I've, I've seen in other countries. <laughs> There are many blessings about living in Canada. Uh, Stephen, Pre Stephen Preston, and then we'll come back to Marcelo, who's just joined us. Well, thank you, thank you, Harold. And let me just say it's a great privilege to, um, to be able to serve on a panel uh, as distinguished as the one you have uh, assembled here. And I thank you for that opportunity. Um, I bring to this discussion the perspective of uh, having been general counsel of a department and also of an agency uh, within the executive branch of the U.S. government. Uh, and I think to address the role here in the most general terms, the general counsel of an agency or department, and particularly in my experience, one, uh, a, a department or agency with an operational role. Uh, in my case, uh, a department engaged in military operations, an agency engaged in intelligence activities. Uh, the general counsel has many hats. Uh, one, and perhaps most generally and abstractly, is uh, the general counsel serves as the chief legal officer of the organization, uh, which, uh, in my experience, by statute, uh, established the opinions of the general counsel as controlling uh, throughout the organization. Uh, that doesn't really tell you much about the role. It's not inconsequential. If you look at a department such as the Department of Defense where there are upwards of 10,000 lawyers uh, organized in multiple components with different clients and reporting chains. Excuse uh, me, could, how many lawyers? Yeah, uh, somewhere on the order of 10,000. 10,000. That's uh, military, JAG officers, civilian, uh, and reserve. Uh, so big number. And did they all listen to you, Stephen? Uh, I don't think any of them listened to me, <laughs> but... Uh, in any event, uh, that's one role. Uh, second, as uh, counsel to the head of the agency, the secretary or the director, I think many incumbents view that as their uh, principal role. I'll circle back to that. Um, the general counsel also runs an office of general counsel, the, the law department, to ensure that legal services are provided throughout the organization in a timely, sound, and uh, responsive fashion. The general counsel is also the principal interface in legal channels with other agencies within the executive branch, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, another role I had was to interface with uh, the <coughs> committees of jurisdiction in the Congress uh, with oversight responsibilities, both in a formal fashion where there were investigations or confirmation hearings and whatnot, uh, and more importantly, perhaps, in an informal fashion by having 
uh, a channel of communication with counterparts on the armed services committees in the case of DOD or the, uh, the permanent select committees on, on intelligence in the case of, uh, of CIA. And then finally, you serve as a, an interface, a principal channel with counterparts at ministries of defense and security services uh, among our uh, friends and allies uh, abroad. And again, uh, there is on occasion a formal role in negotiations, but as important or perhaps more important are the informal communications channels with the chief legal officers uh, at, uh, at an ally's uh, intelligence service uh, or ministry of defense. Stephen, can you, there's a, a saying in the government, uh, to be in at the landing, you have to be in at the takeoff. Uh, how did you make sure that you knew what your clients were thinking about planned operations or other things uh, in time to influence the way that they were structured to ensure their legality? Um, so I think one way to answer that question is the, um, the close lash up between the general counsel and the head of the agency or the deputy head at the level that I serve, but really throughout the organization, having the general counsel's office. Uh, but when you say close lash up, how often did you meet? Uh, did you have a regular meeting? Uh, it would be more than daily. I mean, it was every morning uh, for the stand up meeting and then throughout the day as required. And. Uh, I think this is one of the things that is interesting to me about this role with an operating agency is most often those legal issues and particularly those implicating international law are driven by events, either an emerging threat or a planned operation, uh, military operation, intelligence activity. And we have and have a, uh, an established and reasonably well-functioning process to ensure that as the decision makers, the policy makers were considering action that in parallel, uh, the, uh, their lawyers, if you will, uh, were simultaneously um, exam scrubbing the particular event or activity for legal issues to try to uh, resolve, identif identify and resolve those issues as they emerged. Interestingly, I think, um, uh, Harold, in terms of who the client is, um, there's a very simple answer, I think, for executive branch lawyers in our government, and the client is the United States of America, uh, period, plain and simple, and ultimately. Now, at the same time, the answer gets more complex because uh, not everyone is uh, uh, charged with divining uh, the interests and uh, direction of the United States of America. So, as the case of a general counsel, you have the department or agency whose institutional interests you try to promote in the interagency discussions uh, and in whose legal authorities you're expected to be expert, again, to participate either in advising the head of the agency for actions being taken by the ac uh, agency or to participate in the interagency, the multi-departmental uh, deliberations that ultimately yield a policy recommendation and legal uh, opinions that are provided to the president uh, for making consequential decisions affecting our national security. So Stephen, can you just clarify for the audience, you know, we have obviously a, a civilian control of the military, but we also have a very robust uh, uniformed military core. Um, how do you see your role as advising the, the uniforms and advising the civilians? Uh, I see it as a, a unitary role. I, I don't, uh, in, in terms of my role, um, obviously my, the senior most official that I reported to was the secretary uh, or the director, but in the military context, working uh, frequently with uh, the chairman and the joint staff, uh, with the combatant commanders, with the uh, JAG organizations, uh, both within the uh, military departments, but also as assigned to operational units. Uh, and uh, uh, having spent a good chunk of my career at the Pentagon, uh, both in the last administration and in an earlier administration, um, it was pretty deeply ingrained in me the value that the, mil the career military lawyers bring to the decision-making process. And it's replicated in that process I referred to earlier where uh, 
uh, the uh, State Department legal advisor, the DOD general counsel, the CIA general counsel, the uh, representative from the Office of Legal Counsel at the Department of, uh, of Justice get together. But there was also the chairman's legal counsel, a uniformed uh, lawyer uh, uh, of senior rank uh, whose perspective was, in my view, and I think the view of the group, uh, a critical one as we strove not to come up with an outcome uh, for our respective client agencies, but to come up with the, the right answer for our government, for the United States, uh, f for the decision makers, and for those decisions that are, were vested in the president, for the president himself. I, I should add that the interagency uh, legal counsels group, which met regularly with the White House counsel, was dubbed by Rich Gross, who is the former legal advisor of the Joint Chief, uh, as um, the Justice League of America. And he gave us all uh, plaques when we left office with the, the cartoon figures of the Justice League. Uh, Avril Haines was uh, Wonder Woman. I don't remember whether Steve was Batman or Superman, but <laughs> <laughs> he was one of them. I think I was Aquaman. <laughs> yeah. We now turn to Marcelo Vasquez Bermudez. We're talking about the role of the general counsel as you played it and who your client was and how you perceived <coughs> their interests. Um, it's on. Oh, thank you. Uh, well, first I apologize for arriving uh, l late, uh, but I'm honored to be here with such a distinguished uh, panel. Um, I was uh, a legal advisor of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Ecuador some, uh, some years ago. The international law dealings and the engagements of uh, uh, Ecuador with other states, with uh, international organizations and other bodies are carried out primarily by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, and, of course, uh, by the legal office of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. The legal advisor um, is the head of uh, three directorates, one uh, advising on international law, uh, second, uh, on uh, international judicial cooperation, and uh, third on uh, national law uh, related uh, to uh, the foreign, uh, uh, foreign affairs. What about international trade? Uh, international trade is uh, dealt with primarily uh, by the Ministry of, of Trade, but there is a close uh, uh, cooperation uh, and engagement in uh, negotiations, in the participations uh, in the uh, in international, in international fora, but uh, uh, every um, in specialized areas of the law, uh, such as international trade law, uh, primarily the responsibility is under the Ministry of, of, of Trade. Uh, I would say also that I would add also that um, uh, as a legal advisor, um, my immediate uh, client was the Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs. Uh, which has, of course, the responsibility of conducting the international relations of, of the state. Uh, but by serving the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, I have served the, the state, so I consider also the state my, my, uh, my client uh, and with the uh, interaction uh, uh, through the Minister of Foreign Affairs, of course, other authorities, the Vice Minister, uh, also heads of uh, diplomatic missions abroad and uh, consulates. Uh, in addition, um, uh, various other ministries um, when dealing with international law also sometimes asked for the legal view of the, the legal advisor's office of the Ministry of Foreign but, Affairs. But when you brought a claim against another country uh, in a tribunal, did, you, did, did your office represent the client or did you have outside counsel? Well, um, the international litigation responsibility is um, under the um, uh, another organ of the state, uh, which is the Attorney General's office. Uh, they have a, a legal team that uh, handles the, the cases, prepare the strategy, consult with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs legal uh, office. Uh, but uh, the litigation services is provided by, by the uh, by that uh, organ of the state, which is an independent organ. Uh, they regularly uh, uh, hire uh, specialized uh, law firms, uh, uh, mainly the, the categories of cases that they uh, deal with are uh, 
human rights cases uh, before the International uh, Inter-American Commission on Human Rights and also the Inter-American Court on Human Rights. They do that directly uh, without uh, the intervention of law firms, but the investor straight arbitration cases, they, uh, they uh, contract the services of specialized uh, law firms. And how did your um, uh, role as counselor uh, or legal advisor to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs prepare you for what you're doing now? Um, uh, I have been uh, a practitioner of uh, international law uh, almost my whole uh, career. Uh, uh, I have uh, this interaction, uh, the, this uh, uh, provision of legal services uh, gave me a, a systemic view of, um, of uh, international law and a practical view of international law, considering uh, the needs and the perceptions of, of states in the in international negotiations, uh, the negotiation of treaties uh, and other instruments. Um, also, uh, of course, uh, the consultation uh, with uh, legal advisors of other uh, states, it's, it's, a great, uh, it's greatly beneficial uh, for a legal advisor of a, st of, of a state. Uh, there is a sense of, uh, of legal community, as somebody has said, uh, uh, between uh, legal advisors of, of states all over the world. Uh, more and more, there is an institutionalized um, um, kind of gathering of uh, legal advisors. Uh, for example, during the... But, but to be concrete about it, you're, you're now focused on putting the words of law on a page before you used to deal with the international law in action, uh, how does the one affect the other? Um, now, of course, uh, my, uh, I have a, a responsibility, uh, a diplomatic responsibility in the Organization of American States. We deal with a lot of uh, uh, political issues, but also uh, the compliance of uh, states with, with international law and uh, fostering cooperation. Uh, that is uh, of that, uh, the, the legal experience as a practitioner of international law, of course, uh, helps a lot in, in, in this regard. Great, so we'll now move on to a topic, uh, the, the second half of this topic, um, not just the role, but um, uh, what do you do when your role changes because of unexpected events or um, technological change? So we'll start with Stephen. Um, Stephen, when you came into your position in 2009, I don't know how much you knew about drones or cyberspace or WikiLeaks uh, or election hacking or anything else. Uh, how do you deal with new phenomenon and how do you prepare yourself to engage on those phenomenon in a way that serves your client? <clears throat> well, I was uh, struck by Marcello's uh, observation that uh, he had been a practitioner of international law uh, for uh, almost his entire career. The same could not be said of me when I undertook the job. I was not uh, and have not been a career international lawyer, so for me, uh, not only developing technologies like drones, but the, the whole spectrum of issues. I was very familiar with some, but not as familiar with uh, many others. And uh, uh, now I will hasten to, to add that the, both the President and the United States Senate thought I was adequately prepared for the job to give me the job, but there was a good deal of learning to take place on the job. And for that purpose, I found myself relying uh, on uh, two uh, critical sources. Uh, one was the uh, career cadre of lawyers within my agency or within the department. Uh, it, when I first served in the Department of Defense in the 90s, uh, there was a wonderful fellow by the name of Jack McNeil, uh, an alum of State L, and uh, uh, seemed to know everything and to, know, uh, to have seen everything. And I think in all the jobs, those of us that have served as political appointees, at least in the American uh, system uh, of, uh, of how we, how we uh, populate our executive branch, uh, 
to identify and be able to rely on the career civil servants who have spent their entire careers uh, doing these things has been critically important. So when I was at the agency, I uh, had as a deputy a uh, reserve na naval JAG officer who had spent his entire career doing operational law and had spent the previous uh, eight or nine years uh, all over the international and domestic law issues arising from counterterrorism operations. At the Department of Defense, uh, likewise, I talked about uh, my uh, friend, the late Jack McNeil, uh, but more recently, a terrific uh, collection of uh, career lawyers, and as we mentioned earlier, uh, this, uh, this incredibly potent resource uh, when it comes to um, uh, legal analysis, the JAG community, the, 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 the JAG judge advocates general themselves, uh, and the, uh, uh, the experienced military lawyers that are assigned uh, to the various units. Um, so that would be uh, my short answer to your question, is identifying and relying on, uh, uh, on the people available within. Almost, and at the senior, more senior levels, uh, perhaps even at least as critical are, were my colleagues at the other agencies. So we described this interagency lawyers group process uh, in which we would huddle over these issues. And, you know, in my case, we had uh, this fellow by the name of Harold Coe uh, in the room. Uh, you know, no greater authority on many of the international law issues that we were wrestling with. Uh, but others like uh, General Rich Gross, who was mentioned. Uh, among us, we brought uh, various strengths, talents, experience, and expertise. And it was through that process that we were able to forge, I think, uh, correct judgments uh, and sound advice, uh, drawing on the, uh, the superior experience of some in some areas and of others in others. Thank you. Scott, what was your experience with new issues? Um, I guess as a backdrop to new issues, the, the main challenge as a counselor uh, in investor state arbitration is to come up with a, a position that's um, quick and sound uh, within the time frames for the arbitration. And one example of, a, of uh, such an area that's arisen is whether the domestic measures that are under challenge are attributable to the state at international law. And this is in particular through application of customary international rules um, and principles of state attribution. So under customary international law, the state's obviously responsible for the acts of the classic executive, legislative, judicial branches of government. But what about where the measure being challenged in the litigation has been carried out by an entity that one could argue is a non-state actor? Could you um, give an example of that in your field? Yeah, in, uh, in a recent uh, arbitration, for example, Canada had to defend a case that challenged measures taken by uh, an advisory environmental assessment panel that was established on an ad hoc basis outside of government, uh, outside of the government infrastructure for the very reason that it was to provide objective and unbiased and independent advice to government decision makers uh, on the environmental assessment. Another good example is, is um, we have state enterprises. All countries have state enterprises such as, for example, public utility companies who carry out commercial dealings uh, with um, investors, with companies, and in their everyday commercial dealings with investors, they might end up being challenged uh, as a result of their commercial behavior in an investor state uh, arbitration. So th these bodies are not part of your classic um, branches of, of, of government, and the question arises, well, are they Canada? at international law and should Canada be liable for their acts if they're not part of the state. So how, really did, how did you think about these new issues? You, you told <coughs> us what the new issues are, but how did you gear up to, uh, to, to bring them into your frame of uh, reference? Well, um, obviously because we're in a situation where we're, we're always uh, advising clients and taking instruction from clients, the first hurdle is always getting the domestic client situated within the legal context in which we're operating. The, the officials with whom we work, uh, be they senior management, be they legal counsel, be they the line officials that are carrying out the program and issue, they operate in a purely domestic world. And they're really focused on, uh, or familiar with how domestic liability works. And they obviously need to be briefed on how this 
concept of international arbitration works, let alone what this concept of state attribution, uh, how it plays into to the, uh, to the whole equation. Uh, another challenge is that we have to face is that, that the litigation position that we take it always relates to a specific fact scenario that's, that's taken place. So for us, um, as counsel in an arbitration, the facts are cooked. We have to deal with the facts. It's the, the process starts from a different place than the executive's policy decision-making process. It's not prospective looking, but rather one that we just have to deal with, with the story as it's already unfolded. And we have to determine if the position that we want to take on, on a question of state attribution is reasonable and defensible. But can, can we talk about science? What, what if you have a situation where uh, a trade, what you think is a trade barrier is imposed by another country in the, because of some hormone uh, or some other thing, and you think actually that the hormone uh, is in fact not a trade barrier, it's a, a necessary scientific measure. How do you figure out the science behind that issue with your legal team? I understand how they can work issues of attribution, which are legal questions, but mm -hmm. what about these questions of scientific causation? You're getting into a field that, that I've, I know I'm familiar with the case, but not, uh, not intimately involved in it, but obviously you have to rely upon um, another arm of government, and that's the science, the, the people within government that have the scientific expertise, because that's just another um, uh, piece of the facts that inform the position that you want to take. Um, and obviously, I guess, <clears throat> you're talking more in, a, in an offensive context, I suppose. Um, but that same type of risk assessment has to be making, taken as to whether you're going to have a successful outcome on the basis of that science. But it's, to me, it's the same exercise that you um, uh, would, would undertake to get an understanding of a domestic uh, legal regime that's under challenge. Uh, you have to do outreach within government to find out what the scientists think about whether there's a, a legally uh, challengeable case that you can make. But, but increasingly we have a situation where defending the rule of law may also be defending a certain set of facts as the truth against those who would challenge it as untrue. Is that right? Uh, sorry, can you just rephrase the question or repeat it there? Yeah, climate change is not man-made. <laughs> if you're going to defend a rule of law, you might have to defend a set of facts that, that support your legal argument. Obviously, yes, you're, you're, you are going to get into to, uh, a difficult situation in that regard. But, um, uh, and I think at the end of the day, we, we have to provide, um, we try to confine our role as legal counsel to risk of an adverse outcome or risk of a successful um, a successful outcome and really once we've done that we we treat that as our job as legal counsel um, we may end up getting instructions that are contrary to uh, the you know what, what we've pronounced upon in terms of legal risk or, or the likelihood of a successful outcome but at the end of the day we do take our instructions Manush do you have examples of uh, unexpected or changed situations um, I think Harold with respect to the United Nations, you have to look at it with, from the perspective of changing landscape in international politics. So I think that will be the uh, change of circumstances that affects the, the way that you look at um, problems within the organization. Uh, let me say that the charter is not just a treaty. Charter is the, uh, a constitutional instrument as well. And the, if you look at the, um, and I think these are the issues that a legal advisor has to take account with confronting uh, uh, new circumstances. The, the designers, the, the original basis of the charter is that it's an organization that is universal and it operates on the basis of cooperation among states. So it's, uh, the way that they achieved this was that they, when the various organs of the UN operate, they can interpret the charter themselves. There is no judicial oversight for the organs when they, they uh, interpret the charter as they, as they operate. Um, the, specifically, the issue of having a judicial oversight over such interpretations was rejected at the San Francisco conference. And the, reason was to make the charter uh, 
to be relevant and adaptable to the change of circumstances and uh, <coughs> new situations as they evolve. And at the same time, to have the, uh, force the governments to cooperate, um, which means that they have to compromise. And the cooperation, they have to come up with a, the, the um, decision that came out or the recommendation that came out from the legal committee in San Francisco was that a solution that is generally acceptable, it is binding. And by general acceptability, they didn't mean unanimity, but they mean that there has to be sufficient states that they support a particular um, proposition. But is this really, uh, you yourself are on an international tribunal. It's possible, for example, on you know, what are certain ex expenses of the United Nations to get this on advisory opinion to an international court. Is, is it really true that internal lawyers don't think that there's a good chance that their legal interpretation will be reviewed or reevaluated by another court or, or external body? Uh, they do, but normally the legal advisors do not volunteer legal advice. They are requested to give legal advice. Um, I give you um, two examples. Look at the, um, uh, when Yugoslavia fell apart, the issue of admission of uh, Serbia and Montenegro wanted to remain as the replacement of Yugoslavia. And Yugoslavia was uh, the original signatory to the uh, San Francisco Conference, so one of the original members. So Serbia and Montenegro wanted to be Yugoslavia, but there was opposition to the, uh, uh, from Croatia, from Bosnia, from the other states that they had separated, that uh, Serbia and Montenegro should not remain as Yugoslavia. They asked, they wanted to have a legal opinion from the legal office, but the body, that is the General Assembly and the Security Council, did not want to have a legal opinion from the legal office. They went ahead and they passed the resolution, and then the legal office was asked to write an opinion of how you implement the resolution. So the original decision was a political compromise as to how to resolve this issue between uh, Serbia and Montenegro and between the, uh, the, the other states. Now, the same thing, you compare that with uh, when the Soviet Union fell apart. Uh, Russia did not have to ask for new membership. Russia simply took the place of Soviet Union. And uh, the only difference was that here, the other 11 states that they separated themselves from the Commonwealth, they agreed that the Soviet Union, that Russia will be the uh, take the place of the Soviet Union. There was, again, no legal advice from the legal office. So you have, there are comparable uh, situations that it happens, neither of which they asked for a legal advice, because it was decided that it has to be resolved on political grounds. And this brings me that if you look at the way that um, problems have been addressed in the international organizations, um, during the, um, the Cold War, it was very much understood that if there is a dispute within the, within the states, I'm talking about in the context of international organizations, there has to be a political settlement. You looked at it as to how you resolve the dispute in the context of a political resolution. And the function of the legal advisor or law was to sort of put together this political understanding, generally acceptable solution in legal terms and make sure that it avoids any legal hurdles. So Manush, how important is a, a principle like originalism? I mean, you're talking about a legal interpretation that will deal with the practicalities of a current situation, but um, we hear a lot in, uh, in American constitutional law about original intent. In fact, the original intent of the UN Charter was not that the Secretary General would be very powerful, but that you would have a big role for the Trusteeship Council. It didn't anticipate, as you said, states disintegrating. So uh, what kinds of interpretive principles do you use as a, a legal advisor internally to construe this or organic document? 
I'm not sure that, um, you see, there is, a, there is a distinction between the, uh, uh, the originalism in the U.S. Constitution and in the Charter. The U.S. Constitution sort of strikes the interpretation of the, of the U.S. Constitution. In the Charter, on the other hand, the way they devised it was to allow it to develop, organically develop. And that's why you have the Economic and Social Council just went out of, one of the principal organs just went out of business. It's perfectly okay. But it, it allows the adaptability for the organization. Uh, the way, for example, they deal with some of the issues of the uh, deprivation of the privileges of member states, so membership, there isn't much in the, in the charter. It's been developed by the practice uh, of the organization. But what I was going to say, Harold, was that that period of the Cold War, which political resolutions was the primary concern, and legal advice or things would come to sort of put it together and make it acceptable, uh, was changed after the Cold War. And you have now an era that is, I think we can call it the rule of law-based uh, international relations, where uh, you had it within the UN also was a decade of international law where the problems now have to be uh, distinguished. If you have a crisis, you take the legal issues out of the political issues. So as if now in the past they were all co coherent problems. Now you have a political problem, and out of that political problem, you have a legal problem. And I think that is a challenge for the legal advisor because now you, your outlook is changed. The predecessors had a different outlook. Now you have to come up with legal solutions for the legal aspect of the problem. But you cannot resolve the problem just by looking at the legal aspect of the problem because the political problem is connected to it. So the, it, it's sometimes looking at the problem in such a separate issues, political, legal, it's, it's an obstacle in resolving the, uh, the crisis, which is the function of the UN is to resolve problems. So we'll, we'll get to the relationship between law and politics in the next round. But Marcelo, do you want to say something about new issues? <clears throat> um, well, the, the, the central task or challenge uh, uh, for the legal advisor is to provide prompt and adequate uh, uh, legal advice in a rapidly changing uh, international environment. And uh, the international uh, law system is uh, permanently uh, in a permanent evolution uh, and change, and that's particularly the case in a, a some areas that have been regulated by, by international law in relatively uh, recent uh, times. That's the case, for example, in uh, international environmental law where you don't find necessarily a, a regulated uh, by treaties in, in, in many of those uh, areas. Uh, so it's important to, to look uh, evidence for customer international law in various uh, materials. Um, in this context, we, when uh, sensitive uh, issues arose, in the, for example, in the, in the case of Ecuador, in a, in a case on international, involving international environmental law, uh, my legal team and I had to look into uh, this kind of evidence, but also uh, environmental uh, situations and s situations and cases are fact intensive and uh, <coughs> involving uh, involving complex um, uh, scientific and technical uh, information and, and evidence so the the contribution of and consultation with uh, for example the ministry the ministry of the environment and other institutions uh, was crucial to put to put together the case uh, the case uh, uh, concretely was um, uh, on uh, a dispute with a neighboring uh, country on uh, uh, environmental transboundary uh, harm. Uh, we managed to put together the case uh, and it was taken uh, on by the uh, Attorney General's office uh, that I mentioned is uh, responsible for international uh, litigation. Uh, but uh, 
we had a lot of consultations throughout the the the, the treatment of, of the case. Uh, there was no possibility to arrive at a negotiated solution, so the case was taken to the International Court of, of Justice uh, in 2008. Then, but uh, uh, the relations uh, with the, 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 between the governments of the two states improved dramatically, and that favored uh, a new, uh, renewed. Uh, 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 conversations and uh, dealings, and finally uh, that allowed uh, an agreement uh, to be struck. <laughs> so you think the legal dispute resolution led to a greater policy, uh, better policy outcome? Um, there is um, a policy decision to be to be taken by the decision makers, and it, that involves. Uh, so let me repeat the question. So sorry. do you think that the legal challenge led to a better policy outcome? Uh, of course, you are, uh, 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 it's, it's a catalyst for, to, to improve, to look for better uh, solutions and uh, uh, to take up the, the, the challenge, of, of course. But I, not, I, I don't know if I'm... <laughs> Right, I take that as a yes. So let's, let's go to um, uh, Stephen again. We'll talk a little bit about the relationship between law and policy. So um, were there times in your roles as a counselor of international law where one of the following two things happened? Um, a policymaker wanted to do something and you thought that's illegal but legitimate. Or a time when they wanted to do something and you thought that's lawful, but awful. <laughs> and if those situations arose, how do you advise the client on those options? Well, I think I can safely say I've dealt frequently with both of those scenarios at the beginning of the day, but by the end of the day, uh, not so much so. So, uh, and this goes very much to the role of the in-house uh, counselor in international law. The, in my experience, the decision maker, whether it's a military commander or the secretary or, uh, or the White House policy making process, they are more focused on mission and objectives. And the role of uh, the counselor, in my view, uh, is largely, perhaps chiefly, to work with them to find lawful paths towards lawful objectives. So uh, a decision maker, policy maker, may come into the discussion uh, with um, a you know, clearly legitimate objective and a path towards that objective that is highly problematic legally. My view is, and my practice was not simply to throw a red flag and lead the room, but rather uh, point out the infirmity and vulnerability or risk associated with the one, the impermissibility of the one, uh, but work with the decision makers, the policy makers, to forge an alternative path to achieve that objective. So that would be in the, uh, uh, the, um, in the first category. In the second category, um, again, I think it's um, illustrative of the role. Um, you may have a perfectly lawful uh, objective and a perfectly lawful path towards it, but it may be uh, a really bad idea uh, in one's experience or as a policy matter or as a matter of prudence. And my view is that uh, particularly uh, with lawyers at the level of those represented at this panel, the decision makers both expect and deserve the benefit of one's experience uh, beyond uh, the cold reading of the law. Uh, and in my experience, it was, it, that was both important but equally important to delineate between providing legal advice, which could be outcome determinative. If it's legally impermissible, the client uh, official is not going to take that path if his chief legal officer is tell telling him that. Uh, but uh, conversely, if there are problems with it, and based on my experience, uh, uh, I believe there are problems with it, I want to tell him or her that. Uh, but make it clear that I'm drawing on my experience and sense of what is uh, needed right or effective uh, and not providing a legal judgment that, uh, that tends to have a dispositive impact uh, on the decision making.
So Stephen, I can't leave you without asking. Uh, so it's, it's reported in Charlie Savage's uh, book, uh, Power Wars, that uh, in the night before the bin Laden raid, uh, the small group of lawyers who were considering this concluded that it would be lawful, but then you said, or I think it was attributed to you, uh, we have to write down our rationale uh, so that people know what it was before the action happened. I think this is the thing that we're worrying about. We can uh, ignore it. It doesn't have anything to do with bin Laden. <laughs> <laughs> is that, is in fact uh, something that happened and, and if that's true, why did you do that? Well, the truth is I pushed a button on my phone as soon as he started to ask me a question <laughs> about uh, an actual operation. Um, I'm constrained in what I can say, but in that particular case, because uh, of the rollback classification, um, I'm happy, happy to address that. Uh, it wasn't the night before, but in the immediate run-up to uh, the operation, uh, the uh, group of lawyers who had worked through uh, the principal legal issues uh, and worked them through resolution um, uh, on a, a relatively compressed uh, time frame. I think the, uh, the, the notion that I had was that if the operation uh, went well, uh, uh, there would probably be very little examination of the various legal judgments that went behind it. Uh, and conversely, if it went badly, uh, it would have been um, uh, uh, I think it would have gone catastrophic. It could have gone catastrophically badly uh, with a lot of uh, a examination. And it seemed to me that if we were to uh, write up uh, our analysis on the four, five, or six principal issues that needed to be addressed, it would uh, number one discipline our own thinking uh, and ensure that we had a common view of what the correct answer was and how we got there. Uh, number two, it would, if the matter had gone poorly and we needed to explain those legal bases, we wouldn't have the time uh, or the uh, luxury of, uh, of, of putting together what we could do in advance in a much more systematic and uh, complete fashion. Uh, and third, it would also um, serve uh, as, I think, tangible evidence that these issues were in fact examined and these resolutions were reached before the fact and not as part of some post hoc rationalization for what had gone before. Thank you. Scott? Um, I'm going to, well, you, you cited, Harold, illegal but legitimate and lawful but awful. The example I'll cite lies somewhere between the two, and I think that's because it's due to a conflict um, between systems of law. Uh, there's, there's obviously points in the course of an international arbitration where the client may, despite the potential implications for the defense, ask itself whether it can adhere to an obligation that it may have under international law because of a conflicting obligation under domestic law. And this dilemma often presents itself in connection with the discovery process in investment arbitration. Uh, which often requests, uh, results in requests for very sensitive documents. Um, the rules governing investment arbitration typically authorize the tribunal to require the parties to produce documents that are relevant and material to the issues in dispute. And as a litigant in the dispute, while well, the state has, has consented to the tribunal exercising that authority, but there's also domestic statutes, for example, those governing the production of cabinet confidences and they provide that it would be a violation of domestic law to disclose these documents. So in principle, there shouldn't be a conflict between the, the domestic and international law here. Cabinet confidences at domestic law are typically treated as privileged at international law under rules like the IBA, uh, rules on taking evidence, which, which would recognize them as documents of, of special political institutional sensitivity. But there's occasions where tribunals have found that certain documents that might be cabinet confidences aren't privileged at international law, notwithstanding their status under domestic law. And this scenario engages a situation where the domestic client may want to consider a position which these documents, uh, or under which these documents don't get produced, 
despite a tribunal order to the contrary, and we have to recommend on the implications of this. So aside from the obvious point that such a position would be in violation of a tribunal order that really bears no allegiance to the domestic rules, the domestic principles, the counselor may have to advise the client on the, the risk of an adverse inference being drawn, for example, against the state with respect to those documents, which is basically a, an assumption by the tribunal that the documents contain something damaging in them and that they should presume to have that damaging information uh, contained in them. And that could have a harmful or, or even devastating uh, outcome for the actual defense. So you, you could find yourself saying to a client, under domestic law, you might have a right to withhold the document, but if you do, it's going to kill us in the international dispute resolution. Yeah, and the client is uh, typically the, the, you know, the approach of the client is, well, the, they're the master that they serve is domestic law. And um, uh, it's, it's really a difference in perspectives and difference in systems. Uh, and it, it really um, has, has run up, uh, I, I know all NAFTA states have dealt with this, uh, run up against one another. Um, the other major implication of this is, is consideration has to be given to the perception. It's not really a legal issue, but it's the perception that will be had of the state um, by other states, by their tra treaty partners, or even by investors of a state that's chosen not to comply with its international obligation. So. It's not, the, uh, it's not the bin Laden uh, operation example of, of a conflict here, but it's all the same one that, that we have to deal with uh, on a regular basis. So let's the get conflict. Manush and uh, Marcelo and Manush. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, again, that, that comes in the context of the UN. I can think of the conflicts between the charter that uh, can be interpreted uh, liberally uh, by the organs of the UN and a substantial body of international law that has been uh, uh, drafted and has come into force after the Charter and has been animated by the Charter and they have been, many of which they have been concluded under the auspices of the UN. So there may be, that is I think one of the challenges to the legal advisor is that when there is a conflict between the liberal way in which uh, an organ interprets the charter and any possible conflict that might have with the other international law that has been adopted under the auspices of the UN, for example, with human rights issues. I refer in particular to the targeted sanction, which the issue was very, very prominent. But again, I come back to that in the context of the uh, of the UN, legal advisors are not uh, necessarily requested in every uh, aspect of a decision that a political body makes to, uh, to give legal advice. Uh, that doesn't mean that the delegates do not consult the legal advisor, but uh, informally and just, just to seek views and maybe try to modify their decisions. But if there is a uh, political decision decided by the Security Council uh, without asking for any legal advice from the legal office. So the legal office really has no, has no role because these are policy and political decisions that are, uh, that are made. But um, the um, um, one way that, for example, not the legal advisors, but uh, the way, because legal advisors, they all come under the Secretary General, the Secretariat, that they may express their displeasure with the way that things have been handled uh, by a political body or so, is, um, comes perhaps through the Secretary General. I can think of Kofi Annan, who made a statement, I think it was in 1999, his annual report to the General Assembly in which he criticized the criticism of the unilateral uh, humanitarian intervention. And he suggested if in Rwanda, which the UN completely failed, um, if there was a state or a, a group of states that they would have decided without any permission, authorization from the Security Council to intervene, could we possibly say that this was illegitimate? And at the same time, he criticized the NATO bombing of Kosovo, uh, 
which had no authorization, prior authorization from the Security Council, and said that, uh, uh, does, does that really correspond with the, uh, with the establishment of the Charter? So this is at least one way that one Secretary General was frustrated by the way that uh, uh, some of the issues were, uh, were arranged and confronted by the UN, he pointed to the uh, uh, perhaps essential uh, misgivings in the international law and the way that um, the Security Council in that respect has uh, operated and some of the states that is in the, in the context of the NATO. And he got pushback on, from both sides, both from that saying that you can't really uh, deny humanitarian intervention when the organization fails. And he was also got pushed back by just saying that was the NATO bombing without prior authorization was lawful. So these are the ways, as I, as I mentioned at the beginning, it comes in the context that this is an organization is based on cooperation. So there may be pitfalls here and there, but the way that they, the organization tried to correct itself is not by, um, by a legal advice seeking from the legal office or so, it's by, um, by reaction from different organs, by reaction from outside. And as, uh, as they did, for example, with the targeted section, sanction, with the process of delisting a number of resolutions that were adopted, trying to correct that to make it uh, possible for the states to implement and at least not to be in such direct contradiction with the human rights norms. Okay, so Marcelo, and then we have one more quick round and then we'll open the floor to questions. So if you have questions, please line up behind the microphones and we'll try to get a few in. Um, well, first, I think it's important that uh, the, the legal advisor uh, distinguishes uh, uh, to the extent possible between legal issues and uh, policy uh, issues, policy considerations. Uh, second, um, the legal advisor must also state uh, clearly uh, if a proposed action, a course of action is uh, legally available of, or, or not. That is, if it is lawful or unlawful. Uh, but if the decision maker uh, considers an option which is still in the, um, the confines uh, of the law, uh, legally permitted, but uh, awful, as has been said, uh, the legal advisor <coughs> should uh, Make that clear as well. I think to the decision. Uh, so, if it's in a gray authority. zone, if it's in the gray zone, you say go ahead. No, <laughs> I would say think it over, think it twice, and uh, I think the responsibility of the the legal advisor in that case is to look into uh, possible alternative alternatives to uh, reach the same objectives. But that would be so. Uh, so you do all that, and then he says, "I want to go ahead." Do you say okay? <laughs> Uh, you say I resign. Uh, well, the work uh, or the responsibility of the legal advisor is uh, to provide legal advice, take considering the best interest of, of, of the state and uh, a lawful but awful proposed course of action would be for me uh, unreasonable, unwise. Uh, <coughs> Uh, counterproductive or, or even absurd, so I think I wouldn't uh, go along with, with that. <laughs> so let's uh, go to the last question. Um, counselors in international law can themselves make law by making a pronouncement. So a famous example, the, the Tate letter, uh, Jack Tate, acting legal advisor, makes a pronouncement about uh, the move to restrictive foreign sovereign immunity. Starting with Stephen, um, you gave a famous speech. I think it might even be on this stage right here a few years ago. What, what led you to do that? Uh, the speech you gave at this stage five years earlier <laughs> uh, in 2010. Um, Harold's referring to a series of speeches that we in the last administration as the chief legal officers of our respective agencies had occasion to give uh, starting with Harold's speech ten year, uh, in 2010, now eight years ago, at this conference, and really in service of trying to promote transparency in matters of law and national security to the extent uh, possible. Uh, this was consistent with the President's priority on transparency in service of democratic principles and accountability, uh, 
But I think in the area of national security in particular, where uh, so much of the decision making is conducted appropriately in secrecy, uh, and so little of the ultimate decisions are subjected to judicial review, for uh, our government to explain to its people, uh, to their elected representatives in Congress, to our foreign partners, uh, the legal framework under which we're operating, the law and legal analysis underpinning, in the case of our experience, uh, counterterrorism operations by the United States abroad. Uh, it serves to achieve clarity and consistency. Uh, it makes possible scrutiny that otherwise wouldn't be possible and, in my view, is a critical element of ensuring that the actions of the government are ultimately lawful. So. This uh, literally began with Harold's speech in 2010 uh, on uh, targeted uh, lethal operations, passed through the Attorney General uh, and other speeches um, uh, in the 2011-2012 uh, uh, time frame, and then by the time I came along in 2015, uh, discussing issues such as the ongoing conflict following the cessation of the then current combat operation, combat mission of the United States in Afghanistan, uh, and the legal justification for uh, conducting, uh, 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 conducting military operations against this uh, emergence of uh, ISIS or ISIL uh, in Iraq and Syria. Thank you. So we only have seven minutes left, so why don't we get a couple questions and then get the uh, group to respond and summarize. Just, uh, we'll take, uh, just each of you quickly state your question. Um, is this on? Yes, it is. Okay, yeah. good. Um, quickly I'm, state your question. Sure. Um, so my question, uh, I'm in the Office of Legal Advisor at the State Department. My question has to do with legal uncertainty and how you frame that and communicate it to clients. Um, so you might have a question that is straightforward and simple and has a very clear legal answer under an existing framework, but this goes to kind of your, your challenges yep, point. Yep, we got it. We got the question. Yep. Next question. <laughs> Hi, Guillermo Garcia from Texas A&M University School of Law. My question is connected to the impact that centralizing the defense uh, of the, the state in one uh, power has on the separation of powers internally. And so the question directly is, how would you react if the sitting president or the sitting prime minister asked you not to defend an action made by another power, let's say the judiciary or a local government or a state government? Thank you. Last question. Daniel Mandel, I'm in private practice here in DC. I'm wondering, given the breadth of topics faced by um, those practicing international law and the government and the impossibility of predicting what's going to come about in the next year or two or three, what, if anything, can be done by those who want to get into international law, especially in the government, to prepare themselves um, or, or uh, be, better, be re better prepared for the role uh, once they can get it? Uh, that's pretty straightforward. There's a lot of pro bono activity and there are a lot of policies that you could sue about. Um, <laughs> Let me go to the first two questions and put it to the crowd, uh, to, the, to the panel. Uh, how do you deal with legal uncertainty? And have you ever had a situation where uh, one client didn't want you to defend something that another part of the government was doing? And then what did you do in that circumstance? Let, let's start with uh, Scott and we'll end with Stephen. Okay. Uh, well, for legal uncertainty, um, I mean, we, we ultimately, as legal counsel, have to pronounce on risk, risk of adverse outcomes, risk of successful challenges. And um, legal uncertainty is something you can't avoid. Uh, what we do try to do, though, is to assess that risk according to a standard uh, risk assessment criteria so that you can always place um, a determination of legal risk amongst or along a spectrum and that sometimes when you're getting into that zone of uh, it's 40 to 60 percent of either chance of success or chance of adverse outcome, at least the client knows that. And you build relationships throughout government uh, over the course of successive issues, uh, and you can, you can make relative assessments in that regard. Uh, it's not a perfect science, but um, to have a consistent yardstick by which you measure risk, and I'm sure all governments have this set up, is probably the best way of addressing legal uncertainty. Um, could you rephrase the second question there again? Has there ever been a time when you, one part of the government didn't want you to defend what another part of the government did? 
Uh, yes, absolutely. And you'll often see this, um, for example, in, in the investor state context, uh, when there's a provincial measure at issue. And the province may have one view on the way the case should unfold, and the federal government may have another view. Ultimately, um, we take comfort in trying to limit, I think, our role as legal counsel, which is to, we assess risk, and regardless of the differing views, there's one question, there's one answer to be given, I guess, on the assessment of risk. Uh, we advise accordingly, and um, typically it, it can sometimes get into a decision-making battle, but uh, we limit our role to pronouncing on risk, laying out the options in light of that risk, and then letting decision makers take, take their course of action. We you know, ultimately can't impose a decision on competing or conflicting levels or departments within government. Manush? I'm not sure how that uh, manifests itself in the context of, uh, of international organizations. Suppose if the legal uh, advisor is asked for a legal opinion on something that a, um, one of the organs or subsidiary organs of the UN wants to take, most likely an organ wants to take, and there's a question as to whether it is permissible under the charter or the practice of the organization, I think a legal advisor would have to do the same thing, just uh, uh, all you can do is just to um, be faithful to the institutional memory of the organization. There's a 67 years since the charter has been adopted and there's a substantial practice within the organization that uh, a legal advisor can draw from. So just to put out what the uh, practice of the organization uh, has been, what are the limits of the uh, prov relevant provisions of the charter or the resolution is, and uh, the decision eventually would have to be made by that principal organ. Thank you. Marcel? Um, I would say that, uh, uh, concurring with uh, uh, colleagues, that uh, there are sometimes legal uh, uncertainties, and, uh, uh, but the legal advisor should uh, try to uh, find the best uh, available um, uh, evidence uh, of uh, the applicable law and uh, uh, suggest uh, to the decision makers uh, uh, the best course of, of, of action, of, of course. Um, I don't recall in particular uh, some discrepancies between different organs of the state uh, on a proposed course of action. Uh, but uh, the ultimate uh, decision uh, in international uh, affairs rests in the Minister of Foreign Affairs, and if there is a disagreement, uh, the decision is taken by the President of the, of the Republic, the head, the head of state, on the basis of the legal uh, opinion uh, submitted by the, by the legal advisor. Of course, uh, um, uh, in that sense, the work of the legal advisor is of, uh, uh, implies a big, a bigger responsibility, and uh, the authorities like the president or the, the minister of foreign affairs and other public <laughs> officials, uh, in that sense, <coughs> entrust in the work of the, the legal advisor, the, the international uh, law engagements of the state and its lawful uh, conduct. Um, that uh, I could say, thank you. Stephen. So uh, with respect to the first question, I, um, I think about the construct that Scott has offered of, of risk and options in presenting the decision maker with you know, the, an, an opportunity to make an informed decision. And that's a construct that's familiar to me as a private sector litigator, for example. The client wants to know what's, what's the probability of success uh, in the event that this is uh, adjudicated. And I think that uh, is an, an apt construct for like circumstances where, uh, as with trade disputes, there, there are positions and there are mechanisms and fora for resolution. I think it's a different responsibility for the counselor in international law when uh, again, in my experience at an operational agency where the leadership is looking for a determination as to whether there is domestic and international legal authority to take action, to engage in a military operation, to use lethal force abroad. And there, 
the client, if you will, uh, in my experience, uh, uh, both needs and wants a clear answer to that. Uh, uh, he or she doesn't want to hear that uh, in the event that this is subject to scrutiny, we think there is this or that probability that our position will be sustained. They, they ultimately want to know whether it's authorized by law or not. It doesn't mean that the analysis has to be simplified or that they don't need or want to know the subtleties and the uncertainties in it. But I don't think it's an adequate answer when you're talking about the use of military force, for example, to say, well, we've got a colorable argument or this would be a defensible position. Uh, the, the decision maker wants to know ultimately what your judgment is as to whether it's lawful, and then they can make judgments as a matter of policy and prudence about whether to proceed. So uh, we're out of time. We could go on for quite a while. Let me say, first of all, thank you to Kathleen Clausen, the co-chair of the conference, for helping to organize this, and Romain Zamor of uh, Double Voice and Plimpton for his guidance to the panel. Secondly, to Daniel, who asked the question, uh, I encourage you to take a look at the docket sheet for the travel ban case. Uh, you'll see dozens of amicus briefs on a whole range of issues written by individuals and law firms uh, who have figured out that this is a way to respond to some of the things that they are seeing. And finally, I'll just give the maxim that I saw when I was preparing for my own confirmation by Herman Flager, who is a previous legal advisor. Uh, he said, as a rule of thumb, um, never say no if the law and your conscience tell you yes, but never ever say yes if the law and your conscience tell you no, um, which uh, I tried to keep in mind during my time. So let's have a big round of applause for the great panel by the great group of people. <laughs>